Welcome everyone to Ready, Set, Go. This session is all about preparing you and your child for their entry to kindergarten. Kindergarten is a big step and your and for you and your children, and there are lots of things you can do to prepare for this transition. My name is Jacqueline Priest-Brown, and I'm the Early Years Consultant for the Halton Catholic District School Board. And I'd like to take a couple of minutes to have my colleagues introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Lisa Camiso, and I'm the supervisor of Early Childhood Educators and Childhood Programs. Hi, my name is Denise Colley, and I'm the Chief Speech Language Pathologist at Halton Catholic. Hi, I'm Michelle Whalen, manager from the Reach Out Center for Kids. Good evening, I'm Carla Gibadoni and I'm a manager at Rock Reach Out Center for Kids. We would like to thank those of you who submitted questions to us and we've made sure to embed many of the questions into our um, session this evening. Some of the questions were uh, more school specific or more specific to um, the kindergarten program and the routines that you'll be going through at school. And so those will be addressed by your school um, staff team during your orientation. We'll tell you a little bit about more about that um, in a few minutes. So if your question's not answered, please reach out to your school principal um, because a lot of the questions, like I said, are, are best answered by school staff. There were some questions around the health and safety protocols in our kindergarten classrooms. And at this time, unfortunately, we don't know what the protocols will look like for September. But if you're interested in knowing what they look like now, you can check out um, the return to school plan on the board website at uh, www.hcdsb.org. We're going to start this evening by honoring the land. Each of us has a relationship to the natural environment, the land, water, earth, the habitat, and ecosystems. Land acknowledgements provide us with an opportunity to offer recognition, respect to the original inhabitants of the regions that we live in and work on. There are many things that we can do to go beyond simply reading a land acknowledgement script. To make it more meaningful, we need to consider that we are in fact acknowledging not only the ancestral lands, but also the historical and complex intersections of settler impacts on Indigenous histories, economies, ecologies, livelihood, well-being, and governance structures. A territorial acknowledgement is not an endpoint in the journey of reconciliation. Actions create conditions for true reconciliation and create a foundation for restoring, renewing, or developing a new relationship with Indigenous peoples. For hundreds of years, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Attawadaron, the Potawatomi, the Wendat and Lenape nations have sought to walk gently on this land. They assisted the first European travelers to this territory and shared their knowledge for survival in what was at times a harsh climate. Under consultations from elders, knowledge holders from the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, the Indigenous Education Advisory Committee, along with Halton Catholic District School Board, created this land acknowledgement. Halton, as we know it today, is rich in the history and modern traditions of many First Nations and the Métis. From the lands of the Anishinaabe, to the Attawandaran, the Haudenosaunee, and the Métis. These lands surrounding the Great Lake 
are steeped in indigenous history. As we gather today on these treaty land, our Catholic social teachings call us in solidarity with our indigenous brothers and sisters to honor and respect four directions, lands, waters, plants, animals, and ancestors that walked before us. All these wonderful elements of creation exist. Gifted to us by our creator, God. We acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for being stewards of this traditional territory. When we begin as we begin all of our gatherings in prayer, if you could please join me in the sign of our faith. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, our Savior and friend, you have shown us so much love. You are gentle with us, you heal us, you died on the cross for us. And now you ask us, do you love me? As we come to know you better and see all that you have done for us, may our hearts be filled with love for you. Make us eager to always do what you ask of us and to see your face and love you in everyone else we meet, especially those we may find it hard to love. It is your love which turns our lives around. By trying to love as you have loved us, we become more and more like you. Guide us always on our way. Show us each day how to love you more. Spirit of the living God, fill our hearts. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When we think about our evening to, uh, tonight, um, we're going to be focusing on an overview of what helps children emotionally and physically prepare for school. This includes skills that help children learn, having secure relationships, being able to manage their stress and identify their stress, um, having routines, learning through play, a healthy lifestyle, routine checkups, and then we're going to talk about some resources and supports that you can access um, in Halton. Information about what a kindergarten day looks like, as I mentioned before, and the overall routines of the classroom will be covered when you attend your school's kindergarten orientation day, which will be held this spring. Before we begin, we do have a couple of QR codes. We also have um, short links that you can access, um, but we've tried to make it a little simpler by having a QR code available um, on the screen. So what you'll be able to do is scan, um, take, take your mobile device, open up your camera, and then hold your camera to the screen over the QR code, and automatically you'll see um, something that says open, uh, and whatever the link is, uh, and then you, it'll take you to that web website. So if you have the uh, an, a smartphone and a camera app, that's something um, you may want to pull out. Learning to play and playing to learn is a parent resource based on the research of what, how, and when children learn. This was developed by the Best Start Resource Center and will supplement this presentation. To access this booklet, you can scan the QR code directly on the screen as Jacqueline mentioned, or by visiting the website link beststart.org. You will notice as we go through the slides, there will be references to pages and checklists within this resource. We know many of you are going through this process of starting school for the first time with your child. For some of you, it may seem like just yesterday when you were holding your newborn, and now they are heading off to kindergarten in September. So how do you get them ready? Where do you start? Whether you are aware of it or not, you've actually been preparing your child for school for the last three years. Babies are born wired to learn. From the earliest days, you provided a health and safe and secure environment for your growing baby. Over time, you established various family routines, focused on getting ready to start the day, family meal times, spending time together, and concluding your day with sometimes challenging bedtime routines. These routines have not only contributed to your child feeling safe and secure, but they've also helped them master new skills, such as getting dressed and becoming independent. You gave your child words before they could speak by reading books together pointing out and labeling different objects as you read along. 
You taught them feeding skills as you introduced finger foods, then graduated to a spoon and a fork. These everyday opportunities helped your child develop the small muscles in their hands that have prepared them for printing and writing. Also critical to their success in school, you help them develop social skills by teaching them to say please and thank you, being kind, taking turns, and how to be a good friend. So let's think ahead for a moment. What skills do children need to be successful in school? In answering this question, many might focus on the reading, the writing, and the arithmetic. But what we have come to learn is that there are foundational skills that children need which actually help them to be able to learn. These skills can include listening to others, such as their teacher and classmates, following instructions and rules, like hanging up your backpack before putting on your indoor shoes, the ability to ignore distractions, prioritizing and staying on task, getting along with other children, taking turns, sharing, managing emotions, and communicating thoughts and feelings in constructive ways. Being independent, which also requires having a good memory, caring about others, and most importantly, feeling good about themselves. Generally speaking, these skills together are what we call self-regulation and executive function. Self-regulation and executive function are the skills and abilities children learn over time, which help them to plan and set goals, stay focused, remember instructions, juggle multiple tasks, and manage stress and distractions. You'll notice the book icon on this page, which references that more information can be found in the Best Start book on pages six through nine. Let's take a look at a video, which nicely illustrates the role that self-regulation and executive function plays in our children's learning. Ever wonder why some children are well organized and have an easier time adapting to change than others? It's a result of how certain skills develop in our brains at a young age. Scientists call these skills executive function and self-regulation, which can be thought of like air traffic control in the child's mental airspace. Think of a young child's brain as the control tower at a busy airport. All those planes landing and taking off and all of the support systems on the ground simultaneously demand the controller's attention to avoid a crash. It's the same with a young child learning to pay attention, plan ahead, cope with frustration, and follow lots of rules. When executive functioning skills are working well, they're invisible. It's not like you see them in action because they enable children to be a good student, to be a good friend, to learn well. So they're just kind of hidden. It's really when they break down or when a child is really challenged by these capacities, hasn't, hasn't had a chance to develop them very well, that you see problems. Kids with well-developed executive function can deal with day-to-day -day worries, temptations, and obligations that pile up in their minds. They have the skills to regulate the flow of information and prioritize tasks. Executive function is one of the ways we manage stress and maintain an even keel, even as demands on our attention start to pile up. Kids who haven't developed strong executive function have a harder time directing mental traffic. Without the ability to prioritize, thoughts pile up and collisions occur, leading to frustration and anxiety. First of all, uh, we aren't born with executive functioning skills. Executive functioning skills are capacities that we learn. It's very important that children be in relatively pr predictable, unchaotic, uh, environments <laughs> that are free of toxic stress because when we are surrounded by chaos and disorganization and especially if we're surrounded by fear and anxiety and a world that feels threatening it's very hard for children to acquire these kinds of capacities like most skills good executive function depends on a strong brain foundation that develops in our earliest years of life Caregivers can help by setting a good example with their own behavior, 
practicing serve and return interactions, and preventing toxic stress. As kids grow up through their preschool years and even into their teens, a stable, predictable environment will help them develop good executive function skills. Executive functioning skills can be trained and taught. You do not have to give up on a child who has these problems. There are very sensitive periods during the ages from about two to five or six, and again during adolescence. Um, when these um, skills seem to be kind of growing by leaps and bounds. So you have a, a couple of opportunities and ideally do both. The human brain is an amazing thing. With practice, it can learn to pay attention, plan ahead, prioritize, and react to events as they unfold. Just like the air traffic control tower at our busy airport. With help from the community, kids can learn the skills they need to thrive in a challenging world. This video reminds us that children are not born with these skills, but they develop over time when given repeated opportunities to practice within the context of healthy environments and relationships. And it's never too early nor too late to develop these skills. As the video points out, there are at least two key points in children's development where these skills can be enhanced, preschool and adolescence. It is a very important part of development, so important that even schools measure it and call it learning skills. Human beings are wired from birth to connect, attach, and belong. This need for connection and a sense of belonging is important at all stages of life, not just infancy and preschool. However, the earliest relationships in a child's life matter, setting the stage for children to learn about themselves and the world around them. According to the research, children with healthy attachments develop a stronger ability to manage stress, form healthy relationships, perform better in school, and enjoy higher self-worth. Overall, children with healthy attachments have a greater shot at a well-balanced and fulfilling life. Children develop secure relationships with others when they are seen, when they feel safe, when they are soothed, and when they feel secure. Children feel that they are seen when caregivers demonstrate attempts to understand and interpret their emotional state, meaning they can see the meaning behind their behavior and try to understand what children don't always have the insight or capacity to do for themselves. Children also develop secure relationships when they feel safe and know that their caregiver is there for them and is not a source of fear. When they are soothed, such as when they are sick, tired, scared, hungry, or even sad. And when they feel secure, knowing their caregiver is predictable, responsive, and emotionally available to them. Building healthy attachments is an ongoing process. As children grow and gain the confidence to explore their world, they continue to benefit by fostering healthy attachments with others, such as their teachers, peers, and coaches. Even children who feel safe and secure experience stress, and too much stress interferes with their ability to learn. Dr. Stuart Shanker, a professor at York University and an expert in the field of self-regulation, refers to five sources of stress in children which need to be acknowledged and managed for learning to happen. Those sources of stress can include physical stress, such as being overwhelmed by a noisy or busy classroom, or perhaps feeling hungry or tired, which can affect a child's ability to stay focused. Think of a child who, need, who may need a nap at the end of the day. Emotional stress. Children who are very sensitive or reactive to new situations may be quite anxious initially when they transition to the new school setting or have to separate from their caregiver. Cognitive stress, learning new skills, new routines, dealing with distractions can actually be quite stressful for children. Think about your own stress when you started a new job. 
social stress, stress, which is something that may not be on our radar as children often appear to be having fun when they're playing with their friends. But just playing with friends can be very stressful for some children. It is not always easy to wait to take your turn or to share toys. Finally, the last stressor Dr. Shanker refers to is pro-social stress, where the focus of the stress is when a child is learning to be empathetic towards another. This can be a very big deal for some children and often something we as adults even struggle with. Stress may be a normal part of everyday life and we know that the world right now is much more stressful for all of us with the pandemic. But how children cope and bounce back when stressed matters. When we can help young children learn positive ways to cope with everyday stress, it becomes hardwired into their brains, influencing their health, behavior, and happiness as they grow into adults. So how can we as parents help our children deal with stress? Start by learning how your child experiences stress. Do they have a temper tantrum? Do they shut down or retreat? Children do not always have the words to tell us that they are stressed. So we need to tune in to how they're feeling and or how they're behaving. In other words, we need to read their cues. Then ask yourself, what stresses my child? While stress is a normal part of life, we want to reduce the stressors where possible. For example, is your child overscheduled? Are there things you can do to simplify, simplify daily life? Or perhaps you've noticed that your child is having meltdowns at pickup time and their lunch has typically gone uneaten. Plan ahead and have a healthy snack to take with you. Getting those sugar levels up may be all that is required to help your child be more calm, happy, and alert. Label and acknowledge feelings. For example, I can see you're very mad that your friend took your doll. When we help our children label feelings, we develop their emotional literacy or feelings vocabulary, giving them another tool other than their hands and feet to use to express themselves. And by acknowledging their feelings, they feel understood and strengthen their connection with you. If a meltdown does occur, take time later in the day to talk about it. Ask your child to reflect on what they were thinking or feeling before it occurred. Recognizing the triggers and the signs of a stress is a first step in stress management. Finally, we need to teach our children how to return to being calm, focused, and alert. This may include breathing exercises, reading, prayer, being active, connecting with nature, or giving them something they can manip manipulate, such as Play-Doh. It's also important to check in with our own stress. How do you identify and manage your stress? Your child takes their cues from you. Talk about and demonstrate healthy coping strategies when stressed, and most importantly, model self-care. You owe it to them and to yourself. This video that I'm gonna share is a great video as it not only highlights what things can make children stressed, for example, a friend not wanting to play with them, but also that children are competent and have the capacity to learn how to manage stress and problem solve when given the right tools. The video also demonstrates that it's not just kids that are affected by stress, that just breathing can be a good strategy for parents too. I get really mad when my brother hits me a lot. I don't like it when you say you don't want to play with me. When I'm mad, my brain can get a headache and it can start hurting. Your blood keeps pumping because you're like really mad. And you start to get sweaty because you're getting really, really mad. And then when you start getting really mad, you turn red. When your body can't really control yourself, mad just takes over your body. I just get out of control. It's kind of like if you had a jar and then the jar would be your brain and then you put glitter in the jar and that would be how you would feel. Like. If you shook up the jar and the glitter went everywhere, that would be how your mind looks and it's like spinning around and then you don't have any time to think. And you sometimes punch stuff and people when you don't really mean it. When I get angry, I feel it in my heart. I really don't like when I get angry. The amygdala really reacts, but the prefrontal cortex tries to keep it down. 
when I like feel like I want to, you know, get really angry and yell, I just like sometimes, you know, like take deep breath. Like first you find a place where you can be alone, then you find some way to relax and calm down. When I need to calm down, I take deep breaths. I breathe in through my nose. Sometimes I close my eyes or just take deep breaths. It like it's coming down, it's like not like moving. It's like slowing down and then it stops. And the heart plumps slow and then it goes into your brain. Like all the sparkles are at the bottom of your brain. My brain like slows down and then like I feel more calm and then I'm like ready to speak to that that person. Strategies such as the one demonstrated in this video have the power to work when they're routinely practiced during times when we are not experiencing stress. Then when we need to call upon them, they become second nature to us. So think about practicing this with your own children and even possibly creating one of those sparkle jars. That's um, something you can do with your family as well. Now let's take a look at a special kind of stress in our children. Some of you may wonder, how do you get them to let go and explore if they won't even leave your lap or your leg? This is a common concern for parents as their child enters kindergarten. And we know that it's probably even a bigger concern this year because a lot of children have been um, at home more than uh, they typically would have. So we're going to watch this video and it illustrates nicely how you can help your child manage their anxiety about starting school. There are a few things in this video that can't happen because of pro, um, health and safety protocols currently, um, but it's a nice, uh, gives you some nice tips on what you can do. It's an early September morning and the late summer air is awash with mixed emotions. Your little one is going off to the first day of kindergarten. Yes, you're excited for your child, but you can't help feeling uneasy about the separation. While naturally you have concerns, it's important not to relay this concern to your child. At this age, your little one looks to you for comfort and protection. So use warmth in your tone of voice, enthusiasm in your words, and confidence in your actions. When you arrive, the schoolyard is bustling with activity. Shrieks of delight from excited older children cause your child to freeze up. Don't worry, it'll be fine, you say, but your assurances are met with resistance. Your child is too young to understand this fear and worry, so expecting your child to overcome these intense feelings isn't helpful and may further the frustration. You try again using a calm, soft voice I know this is all new, but I'll help you through it. I know how brave you can be. With a sniff and a nod, your little one finds some courage. Luckily, you've arrived a bit early. This gives you time to familiarize yourselves with the school grounds, find out where you need to go, and see if there are any other families you might know. When you enter the classroom, your teacher greets you with kind words and a warm smile. Your little one clings to you. Rather than reacting to this fear, you remain calm and confident. 
I know you and Miss Honeydew will become good friends. She likes books and fish and cats and dogs too. Look at all the cool things in this classroom. At the mention of pets, your little one perks up. I bet you're going to have a great time. And just in case you get worried, here's a sticker. When we look at these, we will think of each other. Though perhaps still a bit shaky, your little one seems ready to take on the day. The classroom fills and you realize the time has come to go. How you leave is very important. At this time, your child will be paying close attention to cues for leaving. A long, drawn-out goodbye can confuse your child. On the other hand, sneaking out of the room can create a feeling of abandonment. Give your child a hug and a kiss, and say goodbye with a warm smile. Your teacher will be here all day to teach you lots of cool things. When I come pick you up, we'll have so much fun together, and you can tell me all about your day. The first days of school are critical to your child's growth. Big changes in life are challenging and force us to adapt and grow. If you meet these challenges head on with empathy and confidence in your child's abilities, the seeds you sow now will bloom into a rich future for you and your wee one. To learn more about separation anxiety in children and things you can do to help, visit anxietybc.com. Separation anxiety is a normal part of growth and development in the toddler years. And with care and attention, most toddlers usually outgrow it. But starting a new routine, such as starting kindergarten, can cause some children to once again struggle with separating. If you're worried that your child may have a difficult time with this, think about the following ideas. Introduce them to a new, new experiences in a slow and careful manner. Plan ahead and let them know what they can expect and be positive. Practice separating. Start by building in short separations with your child by leaving them in familiar child-friendly environments. Think about ways you can offer opportunities to separate from your child. Perhaps if they are always with one parent, the other parent takes them for a walk alone. Or visiting a relative in your social bubble and leaving them for 10 minutes or so and then working up how long you're gone. Have a walk around the school they will be attending after school day hours and let them play in the yard. Attend your school's kindergarten orientation night and virtually meet potential educators. Remember to give lots of praise and acknowledge feelings. You're such a big boy now. I know you're nervous. I was scared too when I started my new job, but I know you can do this. Try role playing with your child. Play school and make it fun. There are many books too about starting school. Check out your local library and discover the books together with your child. The book on your screen is called The Kissing Hand by Audrey Penn. This is one of my favorite books and I read it to my children as they were getting ready to start school in kindergarten and the following even um, couple of years. It's a beautiful story where a mother raccoon is separating, sending her, her little baby raccoon off to kindergarten and in order to remember her throughout the day, she gives him a kissing hand. And so he can put the hand up to his face and feel his mom's love throughout the day. It's such a beautiful book. Um, and so check out your local library to see if that's available uh, for you to look at. It's, it's Again, it's a great book to help them understand um, separating and also can become you know a, a wonderful routine for you to do. Some kids even like a visual reminder, like a little star or a happy face drawn on their hand or a sticker on their hand. Pickup time is just as important to your child as drop off time. And at the end of the day, we like to remind everybody to connect before you direct. And what we mean when we say this is to show them that you're really happy to see them. Greet them with a smile, give them a big hug or a high five, tell them you miss them and you're happy to see them, allow them to show or tell you about their day before moving on to the next task, before saying, get your coat on, where's your backpack, hurry up. Help them to develop a positive outlook about their school experience by asking them to tell you about two things that happened to them that day that were great. And when you meet your children's, your child's educators, let them know that your child may struggle with separating. They're part of your team and they want your child to succeed as well. And they will work with you to help them with this transition. So far, we have discussed how positive relationships and managing stress contribute to the development 
of self-regulation and executive function skills. Next, we are going to talk about everyday practical things you can do to help prepare your child for school. Starting with routines. Establishing predictable routines not only helps with separation anxiety, as Jacqueline has previously mentioned, but also with family functioning and transition to school. Routines help children to know what is important to your family and what is expected of them, which then allows them to feel healthy, safe, and secure. In turn, having that security allows them to feel calm, in control, and able to cope with stress and change. Routines also allow your child to be more independent. Your child will feel more confident to take risks and try new things on their own. There is a routine and self-help checklist in the Best Start resource that we mentioned earlier on page 28 that I encourage you to complete. It lists some common skills that help children prepare for school. Some examples include, my child gets up around the same time each morning, my child can tell others his or her full name, and my child knows how to dress themselves, except for some button zippers and ties. These are just a few examples of some routines or self-help skills you can start to develop in your home between now and September. And please know that if your child has not mastered these skills yet, their educators are always ready and willing to help out. A common stress for parents and children is getting out of the house in the morning, on time, and with no arguments or raised voices. Most children at this age still need prompts to move them through the morning routine. And one tool that you can use is a visual schedule. This allows you to provide that reinforcement with your child and increase their independence at the same time. You could personalize it to your own family, get your children involved by helping you pick or draw pictures, as well as have them check off the boxes as they move through each step each day. This type of tool is also helpful to direct children with other routines, such as bedtime or bathroom routines. There are many other tools or systems that families put in place. This is just one example that has been well received in the past. Developing routines in the home is a great start. There are also some community programs that can help your child prepare for school, such as drop-in programs that are being offered virtually right now at early on centers and public libraries. You can check out the public library and early on websites for different program offerings. Toilet learning is also a very important part of being independent. If your child is not yet able to use the toilet independently and wash their hands afterwards, then working on these skills is very important. There is helpful information on toilet learning on the Halton Region website, which you can access by scanning the QR code on the slide with the camera on your smart device. Or we will also be referencing the Halton Region website again at the end of this presentation. Another thing that parents can do to support their children's learning is provide opportunities for play. We want our children to grow up to be critical thinkers, collaborators, and problem solvers, as those are the skills that they will need when they are adults. Children learn through their play. It really is their work. When they climb play structures or create a picture at home, they are discovering how their bodies move, as well as developing their large and fine motor skills. When they work on a puzzle with you and try to figure out where each piece goes, they are developing problem solving skills. When they play a board game with the family, they are learning to take turns and how to get along with others while developing early numeracy and literacy skills. When playing with others, they have opportunities to learn how to manage strong emotions and develop positive coping skills. And when they're playing outside and exploring the world around them, they are developing problem solving and innovating skills. All of these examples of play help to develop self-regulation and executive functioning skills.
you as a parent have a very important role in encouraging play with your child. You can do this by taking your child's lead and building on those everyday moments, such as playing the I spy game while driving in the car, where you can promote learning about colors and taking turns, or having your child help to set the dinner table, where they can learn about numbers, their right and left, and using directional language, and reading together, promoting that love of literacy through pictures and story. You do these things every day without even realizing how much you are teaching them through the fun everyday tasks. Pretend play gives children the opportunity to walk in someone else's shoes, which helps to teach them the moral development skill of empathy. This is not a skill they are born with, but one that needs to be nurtured, experienced and practiced. If you have a chance to stop and listen to your child as they play make believe, you may be surprised to hear them speaking to themselves, repeating many of your family rules, ones that you've been trying to teach them along the way. Of course, it's all about having fun with your kids, allowing yourself to be silly with them and being present. Promoting a healthy lifestyle also helps children to be better prepared for school. Set the stage for healthy sleep habits. As you can all probably relate, when we're tired, we have a harder time managing our emotions, following instructions, or doing what we're supposed to do. The same goes for our, ki our kids. The Canadian Pediatric Society recommends that children ages three to five get 10 to 12 hours of sleep a night. Experts also recommend limiting screen time at least 30 minutes before bed to help prepare your brain for sleep. That goes for us and our children. As was mentioned earlier, setting routines and expectations help children to feel safe, calm, secure, and able to cope with change and stress. And this is true of bedtime routines as well. As they transition from summer mode to starting school, begin the bedtime routine for school at least a week before school starts. This would mean having your child in bed between 7 and 8 p.m. so that they are getting the 10 to 12 hours of sleep that they need. Closing blinds or drapes and keeping the lights low during the bedtime routine helps them to relax before they go to sleep. Being active also supports a healthy lifestyle. As we mentioned earlier, being active is also one way children can play and learn. Physical activity is great for healthy hearts, brains and muscles and is good for everyone in the family. Finally, eating healthy. If you remember what was mentioned about self-regulation and sources of stress with children, one of them was physical stress, which includes hunger. It becomes very difficult to focus, listen, or even be nice to your friends when you're hungry and tired. If you speak to most parents, they will say that packing lunches is the bane of their existence. Unlockfood.ca is a great website which offers snack and lunch ideas for even our most selective eaters. All schools have guidelines about snacks and lunches, and currently there's a rule that no special snacks to celebrate birthdays, for example, are allowed for the whole class. This is a way to ensure they're following their healthy school guidelines, public health guidelines, and our anaphylaxis policy. Many schools are now eco or green schools and adhere to litterless lunches. This means that they encourage families to pack snacks in reusable containers to create minimal or no waste to benefit the benefit to this is that it allows you to monitor what your child is eating or not eating. You can help your child by trying out different containers. See what types they can open with little help. We do this as a family every summer. We make a picnic using the containers we will be using for school, and I have the kids try to open their own containers. This way, I can see how they handle them and where they might need help. It's best if you pack them small, healthy, easy to eat snacks even ones that allow for them to eat some now and finish later. Offering a snack after school can help children who may be hungry after a full day of learning and activity. When deciding on what to provide for snacks and lunches, it's important to limit sugary, sticky junk foods and dried fruits and juices. Dried fruits, although they can be a nutritious snack, tend to get stuck easily in teeth and therefore can cause cavities. They are best consumed when you can brush your child's teeth immediately after. Instead, offer things like raw vegetables and fruit, cheese and crackers, seeds, yogurt, milk, or water. Also, find out what types of food work best for your child. 
A thermos with soup or pasta may be too messy and difficult to manage for your child. Practice these snack routines by having your child try opening the containers and eating independently, like I mentioned a minute ago. Another suggestion is to label your containers one, two, and three. One and three should be smaller snacks with two being the main lunch. This helps children to learn to eat the healthier snacks first. Finally, all Ontario schools have a no peanut or tree nut anaphylaxis policy in place. This policy is available on the school board website if you would like to take a look. If your child really likes snacks that contain nuts, it would be a good time to start to introduce other foods into their diet. Some other things to remember when thinking about healthy lifestyles. Make hand washing a regular part of your routine. Keep your child when they're home when they're sick and have a backup plan for illness. There may be many times when you get a call from the school to come pick your child up when they're sick. If you can't get there quickly, think about who could and ensure that they are on board with your plan. And finally, don't forget to send your child to school with appropriate clothing. The kindergarten program supports outdoor play and learning. Winters are cold and springs are wet. The children will need hats, mitts, boots and snow pants in the winter and hats and possibly rain boots and raincoats in the spring. Often schools will also ask parents to supply a pair of indoor shoes for the school year as well as an extra set of clothes for children in, in case their clothes get soiled. Again, these are questions you can ask or you'll be informed of at your school's orientation. This time of year is also a good time to start having regular checkups. We know that children learn in various ways, and one of them being through their eyes. Children who cannot see objects in the distance, focus on a picture or follow words in a book may struggle at school. Vision problems can also impact hand-eye coordination for physical activities and even impact social development. It is recommended that you make an appointment with an optometrist to have your child's eyes checked prior to starting school. Assessments are covered through OHIP, OHIP for children under 19. There's also a suggestion of following the 20-20-20 rule from many eye doctors, where every 20 minutes you look at something 20 feet away for 20 seconds. This is recommended as it reduces stress on our eyes, especially the stress of looking at screens. The Ontario Association for Optometrists have an ICI Learn program, and it gives a complimentary pair of glasses, if prescribed, to junior kindergarten children following their OHIP covered eye exam with our participating optometrist. So the website is up on the screen. It's called www.icilearn.ca or you can call 311 for more information. That's the region's uh, phone number. Another routine checkup for your child's uh, your child is oral or for their child's oral health. Healthy teeth and gums are important as a child grows to help them develop good speech and language, healthy eating habits, and generally feeling good about themselves. It's important to visit a dentist before the start of school. Halton Region has several oral health programs that can be accessed by families who may not have dental coverage or have a limited income. You can find out more about the programs if you visit the Halton Region website or calling 311 for more information. Another thing that when we're talking about physical health is ensuring that your child's immunizations are up to date. When you registered for school, you needed to show proof of immunization or an exemption letter. Consult with your doctor to ensure your child has all the immunizations needed. Children require a booster between four and six years of age. Family physicians do not automatically update the health department on your child's immunizations. That's the responsibility of the parent. The health department now has an online reporting system to make this process easier for parents and caregivers. You also may want to track your child's development. Sometimes a child will let you know that they're struggling with their development through their behavior. One tool you can use to check to see if your child's development is on track is the Look-See Developmental Screen. It's a quick survey that looks at the key skills most children should master at a specific age, and it can help you determine if there are any areas of your child's development that may need extra help. The screen is available in the Best Start resource on pages 16 to 23. The screen starts at ages one to two months and carries on to six years of age. 
You can request the Look-See Developmental Screen by calling 311. And now I'm going to pass it over to Denise Colley, our Chief Speech and Language Pathologist. Good evening, everybody. Continuing the theme of check-ins and check-ups, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about speech and language. A lot of the suggestions you've heard tonight of how to promote play and connection also support language development. Our team of speech language pathologists and communicative disorders assistants work closely with our kindergarten educators to support all students in developing their speech and language skills. Speech, the sounds we make when we talk, and language, when we put our thoughts into words and, and listen and understand others, are the base on which we build all learning. A child's language helps them to develop socially, cognitively, emotionally, spiritually, and academically. Language is important for developing the self-regulation and executive function skills that we've learned about. It's hard to manage your emotions if you can't talk about them. In school, talking and listening are especially important in learning to read and write. When we're looking at some of the milestones to consider for a child who is entering into kindergarten, we would look at, does your child listen to simple stories? Are they using sentences of four to six words? Can they tell about things that they've done? When they use speech, are they understood most of the time by somebody who they don't see all of the time? Do they understand words like under and in front of? Can they use is and ing in sentences like he is running? Can they use ed as a past tense like cooked or walked? And can they ask WH questions? So are they asking you who, what, where, when, why, and how? On this slide, we can see that before a child enters school, there is some publicly funded preschool speech and language program services available through Aeronaut Kids, which is our local children's treatment center. If you feel that your child would benefit from speech and language support, I encourage you to contact Aeronaut. A referral can be made by a parent. You don't need a doctor to make the referral for you. I would also encourage you to get your child's hearing checked if you have any concerns about their language development. Referrals to the Erin Oak Preschool Speech and Language Program um, are ch for children from birth up until June 30th of this year, so the year that they're starting kindergarten. Um, a child must live in Peel, Halton, or, or Dufferin County. Um, and you can call Erin Oak at the toll-free line that's listed on the slide um, and just press one and that will take you to their intake line. If your child does receive support from Erin Oak for their speech and language, um, please ensure that you have indicated this during registration. Typically with your consent, Erin Oak will send the school board a discharge report and our speech and language pathologists will review that with your child's educators so that they know what strategies best support your child's learning and language development. Thank you so much, Denise. So let's put it all together now. The key things children need to successfully transition to school are, first and foremost, you, along with having safe, secure relationships, being able to manage stress, predictable routines, opportunities to play and learn, eating well, being active, and getting enough sleep, and routine checkups. These all help to develop self-regulation and executive functioning in our children, which we know now are key skills for life and learning. So here are some next steps to consider before starting kindergarten in September. As previously mentioned, schools will be having an orientation in the spring for new families. You will receive information from your school, or you can find out more by calling the school yourselves. Before and after school care is available at all of our schools. If you need before and after care for your child, be sure to inquire and register soon. Many schools fill up early, so to avoid disappointment, reach out sooner than later to get on a wait list. If your child will be taking the school bus, Halton Student Transportation Services will be holding an orientation day in the summer with, within each municipality. You can visit their website to find out how to register at haltonbus.ca. If you think your child may need special education support in kindergarten, 
or you aren't sure, but are just looking for some information about special education support in kindergarten, Halton Catholic District School Board is hosting a special education information session for parents of children who will be entering kindergarten in September. This will take place the evening of March 24th. Please check out our board website for more details. Good evening, good evening, everyone. I know we're coming to the end of the, the presentation tonight. You heard earlier um, some pieces around self-regulation and um, anxiety potentially that children may struggle with. Uh, so we're here to talk a little bit about some of the resources that are available through the Reach Out Centre for Kids and how to access those. Next slide. So at Rock, we have a live answer line that is available Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. Uh, families can call that line to ask questions about the services we offer, um, gain access to our walking clinic and crisis support as well as um, access to any of our under six programming for children and our autism services. Even if you're not quite sure maybe what you're looking for, just want to gather some information about what we offer, calling that number will be able to help provide you with that. Next slide. Quinn is our virtual chat bot that we have connected through our website. So it's just another way that folks who may not want to uh, make a phone call can connect and chat with somebody um, via our website chat function. Next slide. Access and system navigation is a new mechanism that we have in Halton region that is the point of coordinated access for all of the different partners that you see on the screen here. The mechanism runs through ROC and you are able to access that through contacting our live answer number, which you see at the bottom 289-266 0036 and by connecting here you'll be able to access any of the services or programs that are available from any of those particular partners. Next slide. So a little bit more about access and system navigation. Um, you can see a bit more about the partners and how you can connect here by visiting our website. Uh, referrals come through there that go into the larger system Families don't have to make a referral themselves through using a referral form. You can simply just contact the live answer line Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 p.m. and we'll be able to help walk you through that. You get connected to a service navigator that will answer any of your questions and provide support. Next slide. So Rock's Infant and Child Early Years Services specialize in supporting families, caregivers with children birth to eight years through a variety of programs and services. Parents and caregivers and professionals can access these services through Live Answer Line and Quinn the Rock Chatbot um, at www.rockonline.ca. Uh, these supports can direct you to Rock's front door Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 p.m. Infant and Child Early Year Services, Birth to Eight, provide families uh, with children uh, and the community with a variety of services, such as workshops, groups, walking, counseling, therapy, psychology, and early on programs. Walk-in is operating virtually. Uh, sessions can be booked and offered immediately during the walk-in hours. Walk-in offers single session therapy with referral to brief therapy and other services. Clients can access walk-in when they need to and as often as they'd like. Walk-in has extended hours and now offers uh, under six and behavioral therapy services, caregiver uh, peer support sessions and autism service consultations. Rock's 24-hour crisis line is toll-free at 905-878-9785. The program is for young people up to 18 years old and their parent caregivers. Rock crisis services are short-term, depending on the needs of the youth and family. There may be only a single session, additional sessions, and or consultation as needed. Here we have our service of offerings for families. In the blue, we have uh, services that are accessible directly for families to connect themselves. Uh, so you'll see that we have drop-in programs, walk-in clinic supports, which is the zero to six focus, 
caregiver peer support, autism consultation, crisis support, workshops for caregivers, early on programming, family and caregiver social events and programming, Rock Hub programs, and FASD supports. In the green, you'll see that our services are accessible through access and systems navigation, therapy services, caregiver and children's groups, specialized supports like psychology and trauma, coordination of services, and day treatment programs. So if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can do that a variety of ways. So you can go to www.rockonline.ca, which is our website. Uh, you can call our live answer line or our crisis line, or you can reach out to us through our social media. Uh, we have at Rock Reach Out for Instagram and Twitter, and we have Reach Out Center for Kids for Facebook. Thank you.